Well, we are uh, working through, speaking of work, uh, the book of Jonah, and uh, we are looking at this series that we're calling Transformative Justice, and you remember that the series connects with our values uh, as, a, as a church, what we value, what we desire for the Lord to do within us, developing a work within us so that we're becoming more like Him, and becoming these things that we value. And transformative justice is the fourth value in our uh, church. And we're preaching through a number of different texts in the Bible. And we're coming back into Jonah right now just to sort of finish off the book of Jonah because we see it lends itself so well to this value of transformative justice. Uh, We've been talking about transformative justice being about the justice of God. And uh, if we are to value this deeply... For to value this, we must seek fully the character of God. And so we've talked about how the character of God is being delivered to his people through his scriptures. Oh, it's so important for us to be in the word of God. I pray that you are in the word every day and you have opportunity to be able to uh, follow through in these scriptures that reveal and are delivering to us who God is and what God does. Because as we then are immersed in the scriptures, we find that the Lord is working inside our heart, and he is doing the mystical and very powerful work of his Holy Spirit to transform us, to be more like him. And I'm confident that if that egg was in vinegar for 72 hours, it would become a bouncy ball. I'm going to try it again with Debbie's new vinegar supply that she replenished over the weekend. She literally turned to me. She hadn't seen that video yet. And she turned to me while the video was on and said, there goes all my vinegar. And uh, moments later, I said, there goes Debbie's vinegar supply. Well, we are looking at that transformation as something that we believe the Lord does within us, including building this value of justice and a desire within us to see justice taking place in this world today. We believe that the justice of God is at work to restore relationships, and we're seeing this happening in Jonah. People with God We looked at that uh, last week with Jonah chapter 3. People with one another, even people with creation. But it starts inside of us. Jonah 3 reminded us that we must climb down off of our throne. You remember the three thrones of chapter 3? And we must climb down as Jonah was to do in order to see the justice of God taking place. We must climb down off of our throne. And uh, we must, in fact, meet with and, uh, and, and uh, engage with the Lord himself to do this work within us. It starts inside of us. It starts in our hearts. Well, now for chapter 4. And in chapter 4, what we see at the beginning of this chapter is a lens. We see a focusing in now on the heart of Jonah. In in fact, Jonah's heart is kind of at issue here all along the book, isn't it, in the story? His heart is what's at issue. And now we see a lens of focusing in. It's like we get to kind of open up the, the book and the story and see what's going on now in the heart of Jonah. And that uh, heart of Jonah is, in fact, also representative of Israel's at the time. And it, of course, represents what our heart can become as well. And uh, it's exposed then for us to see right at the beginning here in chapter 4, starting in verse 1. We see that the exposing of Jonah's heart is uh, an exposing of a heart that is filled with rage. Well, Jonah's heart is, is developing towards uh, something. Uh, he's going through these stages of a heart that is dying. And the first stage we've already looked at together, and that was the, the stage of fear. Do you remember we said that it was really fear that was inside Jonah's heart, a fear that the people of Nineveh were going to get away for what they had done to uh, the Israelites and the violence that they had had given, they they had perpetuated towards Israel. If they were going to get away with that, there was a fear within Jonah. That was stage one for his heart. And now we see stage two, as we get the lens inside of Jonah's heart, it's now developing into rage, 
we're going to see that there are four stages. We won't be able to get through them all today, and we'll finish it off next week. There are four stages of a dying heart. And therefore, in contrast, uh, we can read into it what a zoe heart, what a, a life heart looks like, or a heart that is alive, what that looks like. Well, let's get into the text and see uh, what's happening here to be able to understand Jonah's heart that's filled with rage. If we go over to the whiteboard and we look at Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, and I hope you have your Bibles with you, and, and if, or if you have something to write on maybe, uh, that you'd be able to take down some of these notes, because I hope you've seen there's some really interesting things going on with the text. There's some amazing things that are happening with the words in the book of Jonah in the original language, Hebrew. It's one of the other reasons why we really need to study uh, that our Bible is, in fact, reliable. Our scriptures are reliable, and that's why we're specifically doing that PCCU course over the next couple of weeks. I mean, if we're able to look back at some of these powerful ways in which the book of Jonah is worded, we're able to bring out so much that's going on in the text that's helpful for us including verse 1, uh, that lends into Jonah's heart. But, and this is, remember, uh, what's happened now after God has forgiven the people of Nineveh because the king, he got down off of his throne. And uh, he left behind that throne that justified the works that he was doing, these works of violence. And uh, in that repentance, God responded with great mercy and forgiveness, but... To Jonah. So now, now we'll see that his reaction to the forgiveness of God is this. To Jonah, let's get a lens inside his heart. This seemed, listen, very wrong. Uh, there are three words here in the original language that we need to look at. Very wrong, very wrong and angry. And as we look at these words in the original language, we have to understand that this is something that is described as being extremely angry, that Jonah's heart is extremely angry, greatly, exceedingly angry. Uh, the, the word uh, angry is actually from the root word to burn. And so you see, okay, now, now we're getting somewhere with understanding his heart filled with rage. But to Jonah, his heart began to burn with anger. And as we look at uh, the words very and wrong, greatly, exceedingly, they're also the root word for the word evil. So the root word evil is going on in these words. And so as we look at Jonah's heart, we can understand that, but to Jonah, his heart was burning with an evil anger. Yeah, that's a way to be able to look at this. But Jonah, his heart burned with an evil anger at the work of God in forgiving these people. Jonah's fear is realized. God has forgiven, and now his heart has given birth to rage. Jonah's furious anger is something that has led him to sin. And why? Why does someone not getting what they deserve vengeance, retribution, why does that give birth to rage? I mean, why uh, not just get upset? Why doesn't it say, but Jonah was upset about this? You know, uh, he, he didn't want that to happen. He got upset about it. Yeah, or, or Jonah sulked. Uh, Jonah, you know, he, he went away frustrated. But Jonah was frustrated. What is going on? Why does the author want us to really see what's happening inside a heart that moves from fear into rage? Well, the answer of how Jonah gets like this, how he reacts with such incredible, burning, evil anger is actually in the next verse. The answer for this is Tarshish. Tarshish is the problem. You say, John, Spain? Uh, how, how is Spain the problem? Surely not the country of Spain or that ancient area that was called Tarshish. 
But as we see in verse 2, Tarshish comes out here, and we're going to see that the problem is Tarshish when we recognize that he prayed to the Lord, isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home in Israel? That is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. Let's get our map back here to understand what I mean by Tarshish, Spain. How could this possibly be the problem? As we get back to our map again, we can understand that there's something going on with Tarshish. And here's what's going on. Jonah, living here in the land of Israel, is being called by the Lord, as we looked last week, to the city of Nineveh, there in what we call modern-day Iraq, in this kingdom of the Assyrians. And Jonah, he flees and is heading for not just, I'm frustrated, not just, I don't really like what's happening here, God. But Jonah is fleeing and fleeing and fleeing. This is where he wants to go, and fleeing and fleeing to Tarshish. So this is where Jonah wants to end up. And this is where God is calling him. And when you look at the scope of that, there's a reason why Tarshish is named, why he wants to go to Tarshish. This is as far away as one can possibly go in that ancient world, certainly from the land of Israel. It's not just the opposite direction. It is going as far away as he can get from his enemies. I don't like what you did. I don't like what you do. I don't like who you are. I don't like what you stand for. I don't like your sin, Nineveh. I'm against your actions, and I'm not just opposed to it. I'm set against it. That's what we're meant to gather from this. That's why I went to uh, Egypt. No. That, that's why I went to the far reaches of the deserts of Africa. No. That's why I went to Tarshish. That's why I went as far away as I could possibly get, because I'm set against it. I'm poles apart. We use that phrase, don't we? We're poles apart. Look, you can see the poles, can't you, here on the map. We are poles apart, us and the Ninevites. If I'm over here and you are over there, then what began as fear as a need for retribution, can only explode into rage when we set ourselves against someone or something or some people when we become poles apart. See, John, explain this then. How how does that uh, look for the church? Uh, As we look at the church in the world today, the capital C church. Well, the church has always struggled with the world being something that is very different than what we are. The world values things that are very different. The world behaves in ways that are very different than the church in the way that God is calling the church to be. Right? And so uh, Jesus looked different than the people around him, the world around him as he walks through it. His disciples find this constantly around them. So the world behaves in these ways And then the church is not set apart, as we're called to be, but instead we become set against. And we become poles apart from the world, as far as way as possible, shouting our outrage when the world is going the way that it is going. So that's what it looks like for us as a church, and so for justice then to take place. The people of God must cross the distance and enter into the city. For justice to take place and for this to be something that the church as a whole values, we must cross the distance and enter into the city. And that's where Jonah is being called into, into the middle of the city. What does this look like in the home? In the home, this looks like perhaps being wronged 
and then turning away from that one in the home that has wronged you. And your heart then doesn't just move to a place of being frustrated, angry, but moves far out to become set against out to the poles. And so for justice to take place inside the home, then it's people with one another. Uh, God is making it clear through this story that he is in fact working in the lives of those ones who are in our home and we're called to come into the city or come into that person's life and be there where God is. And let me say it this way. I say, John, in the home, you know, if, if someone wrongs me in my own home, if I, if I feel like this is wrong, what has happened, I can't go near you know, God calling me into the city, I can't go near. You know, I'm frustrated. I'm outraged. The Jonah story is teaching us that what you're called to go near to is, in fact, the presence of God in that person's life. Can you go near God? Can you know, go near the Lord who works in the life of that one who is with you? It's a different way of looking at it, isn't it? And it's the way of the Zoe life coming, along, coming alongside of God's work in an individual's life. For Jonah, he heads out to the poles because he thinks that he is right and therefore he should be over there in Tarshish as far away as possible and God should be too. Right? That's what he's thinking. God should be in Tarshish with him. He shouldn't be over there in Nineveh, working in the hearts of people that we know to be hearts that are open, open for change. You say, John, what kind of work is going on? What kind of work is God doing? What justice work is taking place in the lives of these ones who have wronged us or the world itself? What work is he doing? Well, Jonah knows what that work is. It's in the next verse. He knows that this work is, in fact, work that fits with the character of God himself. The work is work of his character being that of being compassionate and gracious. If we look at uh, verse chapter 4, I'm sorry, I'm just looking back to verse 3. Verse 2, rather, which says this. I don't think I have it properly on the whiteboard. So you can ignore that, but you can come into your own scriptures to look at verse 2, which says, He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, alas, Lord. Uh, there we are, yes. Take, oh, it is there, sorry. Uh, take my uh, life from me. Okay, well, let's go back to this then, all right? Sorry for that moment there. We just had to get a little bit of understanding between myself and what's going on here on the whiteboard. Okay, so uh, Jonah's uh, saying, yeah, my, my heart is outraged. Alas, Lord, this is like a frustration. It's the same word that the uh, sailors used when they were shouting to Yahweh. Alas, uh, but for Jonah, uh, unlike the sailors, uh, he is saying, take away my life uh, before it's better for me to die than to live. Jonah is not, uh, in my opinion, he's not saying, I actually want to die. I don't think he wanted to die in chapter 1, 2, and they threw him into the water. But this is a description of what's going on in that heart of Jonah. For he is saying, it's better for me to die than to live, is a way of saying, God, you need to choose, right? It's either me or them. And I hope that you choose me and the way that I want this to go. So it's a description of what's going on in that heart of Jonah. But the description of God is where we were headed. And so Jonah, he is struggling to uh, come out of this heart of rage because he has entered into not just rage, but also pride. So the rest of verse 2 says that he is a God that is full of compassion, and he is a God that's full of mercy. Let's go back to verse 2, which says this. He prayed to the Lord, O Lord, is this not what I said when I was still at home? 
That is why I was so quick to flee to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious, listen to this, you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Those were the verses that I was missing. So a description then of Yahweh's heart being one of being slow to anger and abounding in love, one who is gracious. In this moment then, what we see is that God's wrath is eclipsed by his mercy. His mercy has come upon these people. And the pride that Jonah has in his heart will not allow him to be able to receive this. And so Jonah finds that the Lord speaks to him and says this, Have you any right to be angry? I think the key to that question that Yahweh is asking of Jonah is the word you, right? Have you any right to be angry? Jonah, are you right or is God right? Yeah? Or am I right is how he would say this. Are you right, Jonah, or is God right? In other words, uh, are you uh, the one who's on the throne or is God the one who's on the throne? And if God is the one who is on the throne and Jonah, you are not, then you are not the one who is in control. And pride is something that will not allow you to let go of control. And so if a heart that is filled with a burning, evil anger is also being fed by pride, which is unwilling to let go of control, then this moves towards what we see is a dying heart, a dying faith. Uh, Jonah has an opportunity now to be able to respond with the same kind of heart that the Ninevites had. And that same kind of heart is one to simply come down off of that controlling throne of pride themselves to say, God, I repent. Yeah? God, forgive me. But unfortunately for Jonah, we see in verse 5 that Jonah went out and sat down at the place east of the city. East of the city. He's gone back to the other pole, right? He's gone even further out, this time out to the east. In those places, we find that our heart begins to shrink, our heart begins to die, our heart begins to be confused around what is the character of God and what God is doing in our lives. I want to call us all this morning to uh, really the character of the Lord as it's described here in this book of Jonah. If we're to experience uh, the real transformative justice that God has for us as a church, it begins inside of us begins inside of us as a church, and it begins with us seeking out in the city places, going to the city place, right? Not out to the far ends, the far reaches, where we find that our heart only turns into being set against and turns into burning rage, but instead inside, close to, around those that God is calling us to, coming alongside of what God is doing, come to God in those places of his work in people's lives. And then finding that in those places, as we give up control to the Lord himself, then he works within us to do his wonderful, life-changing transformation, which we call justice. I'd like to pray about this this morning and then come to the table for communion. So let's come before the Lord in prayer. As we come before the Lord in prayer this morning... um, I want to read Psalm 103. I think Jonah was reading Psalm 103. Jonah knows this psalm. I just want to pray this this morning as we come to the Lord's table. Praise the Lord, O my soul. All my inmost being praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits, who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion. The Lord, he works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, 
abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Jesus, we believe this. We believe that you have accomplished this upon the cross. And so today, Lord, as we come before this table to remember you, Lord, and remember your broken body, and we remember, Lord, how you shed your blood for us. In this, in this moment, Lord, what we remember is that your mercy eclipsed your wrath for us. And so, Lord, we put our faith in you this morning as we come to this table. And we ask, God, that you would do a work within our heart. Lord, that we might have that character of Jesus within us. It's in your precious name we pray, Lord. Amen.